a pleasure to speak here. <clears throat> I would be, uh, so that's kind of uh, logos of all my collaborators. We are actually planning to we'll put a whole course on a fine correspondences and how to use it online, like starting with uh, CVPR tutorial, but according to their policy, we, we are not to use, cannot use their videos, so we are decided to, okay, we make our own. So, um, and this, uh, contains not only my work, but uh, other people like Daniel, Jimmy, Levente, so uh, like many, many uh, other people. So let's start. So what is a fine correspondence? We, let, let's start with what is local fine frame. This is like uh, a geometrical part of the local feature, well, a little bit maybe more advanced than key point. You have key point x, y. Uh, you uh, have scale, orientation, and elliptic shape. Uh, that's uh, like was like very popular in 2004 and uh, like around this time when Swift came and has seen a fine and oh like everything was sold like this. Then they uh, went into oblivion when we are trying like uh, to revive them because they are really really cool. Okay, so what is a fine correspondence? And the fine correspondence is correspondence between two local fine frames or fine features. That's uh, very simple. And like, uh, why should you care about this at all? So the question. And the answer is, as uh, normal correspondences, uh, I mean, like just key point correspondences, they are mostly used for geometry related pr problems like single view geometry, like uh, optic perturbation, rectification, two view geometry, finding correspondences, relative camera pose, multi-view geometry, and so on, so on. However, there are like several important properties which they can give you uh, if, if you know how to handle them well, uh, which like uh, key point correspondence cannot. And this one thing is, okay, so you, you could do visual localization from them and basically uh, have like, relative pose and what, what, what so why you would like to do this? And the answer is that because unlike with like just correspondences where you have just X, Y and like a single correspondence is not enough to give you relative pose, nor is two correspondences, three correspondences, minimum is uh, four if you have like some planner scene for homography. With a fine correspondence for homography, you actually can survive with just one fine correspondence and from a little bit additional information like gravity vector or whatever else. Uh, for uh, like more complex things like as uh, to view like in general scene, you need seven correspondences uh, for uh, like key point correspondence and only three of them for uh, a fine one. So that is uh, like. If, if scene is very hard, you probably are low on these correspondences. So that is uh, reduces this requirement and gives you more information. You also uh, can do reconstruction, which is not just point cloud, but oriented point cloud. Yes. So uh, this talk is all about the fine correspondences. My problem is that I don't understand what is the fine correspondence. Okay, let's go back. <laughs> so the correspondence is like if you have uh, to some 3D point in re real world and you have two photos uh, picture in the same scene, right? Uh, then you have pixel or region in, uh, in both images which belong into this 3D point. So that would be a uh, pixel correspondence. If you say, okay, this, uh, cor this uh, pixel correspond to this pixel, this is a key point. Now, uh, if you have, flat surface, you actually can have more than this. You can say, okay, uh, so not only this pixel corresponds, but this surface is the same. And for example, you have normal here and normal there. And you say, oh, they are the same normal, right? Uh, and you also can have some region, for example, oh, let's, let's actually, it would be a little bit later, but, but let, let me jump. So that's, uh, I, I wanted to motivate why it's uh, important, but uh, okay, oh, we can actually use it at this time. Uh, so uh, region, when you have just pixel correspondence, how, how can you establish this? You cannot do this. Uh, like just pixel by pixel doesn't work. You need to do some descriptor like sieve, super point. When you detect sieve, you have uh, some exact region which is like just circle around this. 
And like uh, just in simple case, you, you, you just circle and you can uh, assume like up is upper orientation. Okay, now you have actually uh, two points. So one is center and one somewhere with oriented circle and radius. So this is uh, like, this is proto fine. Now we, we can upgrade this because if you don't do front of parallel view, if you have circle here and then you have circle on like slanted uh, surface, then it is, it would be correspond to ellipse here. So correspond to between ellipse here and uh, circle here is a fine correspondence. Okay. okay. Uh, so one thing is what we have, we can have here is uh, oriented uh, point cloud, which means you have kind of estimation of normal without using like other 3D points. And that's uh, sometimes more useful if your uh, point cloud is very sparse and you cannot just take your neighborhood and feed some uh, like a local plane and then have normal. You can get them just directly from this uh, affine correspondences just because you have richer information. Or for example, when you do slum, that's uh, against this uh, same idea. Okay, if you are on car, uh, which means that you are not going up and down uh, with respect to the surface, uh, you also, the gravity vector does not change uh, and you have a uh, ground plane uh, near you in car unless uh, like you're completely crowded which means that if you take into account all the geometrical information, which means only one single affine correspondence, it can give you relative pose. You don't need uh, more. And this is very good because it's, it is fast and uh, it is more robust and so on. So like uh, a thing which I'm kind of uh, trying to advocate here is that when you have more information from just uh, some single point, you, and you can use it in a clever way, and it can be more precise, more robust, more efficient. Uh, planar segmentation. Also, it is, it is again done uh, by like similar th things uh, as, or is it the, such cool things uh, by James? So you have this, uh, very wide angle images. And if you detect, this is single image uh, case. So we are not doing any relative pose, whatever. We have this uh, wide angle fisheye camera. Now using uh, affine features and affine features is just this uh, like affine key point in a single frame. Uh, you can rectify this and then maybe do measurements there and so on. How it's done? You uh, detect uh, so several local features and they say, okay, if they are very similar, probably this is some kind of repeating pattern. Maybe it's windows, maybe it is a uh, nice floor and something. And uh, from the change of geometrical information in this uh, single view, I find correspondence, you can say, aha, uh -huh, so my image here is uh, distorted this way, here is this way, and you can recover this uh, uh, distortion efficiently. And so on. Yeah, you can do symmetry detection, many other stuff. Uh, after calibration, again, uh, like similar thing, you need to uh, rectify your, your image, uh, like, and uh, like many, many other things. So which, uh, if you're interested in these topics, just uh, talk to your colleague James. He is uh, like guru on this topic. And I'm not. Okay. Uh, uh, hopefully I have sold you the idea of uh, having like local assigned features uh, and the question why, how do we get them? And uh, uh, there are two ways of having uh, correspondence. One is uh, sparse correspondences, which are around some features. And second is dense, which is kind of flow. Uh, so this is like standard pipeline of uh, having uh, a local affine or just maybe not affine, just uh, standard correspondences that you have cover pairs of images. You first pro process them independently. You run some detector. You have uh, your, you select your measurement region. Then you describe it by some descriptor converted to vector to allow efficient matching, run matching. Then you run uh, run stack to find relative pose, and you have verified correspondences. 
So what I would be talking about is this uh, first two parts, detector and measurement region selection. And of course, uh, so we can have it other way around. So like, okay, maybe you have texture less than seen, maybe you have not wide baseline, so we don't detect any key points. You, we just have uh, two frames and then have deep networks or classical optical flow or whatever. These such correspondences also can be affine. So there is uh, uh, like no problem with uh, doing this. Okay, uh, and uh, there are like different kinds of uh, local features, uh, like uh, those which uh, people uh, usually use, uh, and uh, they not really think uh, deeply what they get from them. So I'm going to go from the like original just uh, translation covariant. And translation covariant means, okay, if uh, we have some point in image we detected in uh, this image, and then if we translate this image, I don't know, part is uh, crop somewhere, we also can detect the same point and this uh, position would be just uh, translated by this, our cropping factor or whatever we use. Uh, it can be also uh, relative to rotation, which means that we detect some kind of uh, orientation there uh we also can have scale yes uh okay so so that's um it's dependent on how you look at them before the feature should be uh wait what is feature xy yes xy yes it is rotation covariant but uh, like in terms, okay, it is rotation invariant, which means that if you rotate the image and uh, like around this point, it, it doesn't change, but you don't have rotation. Uh, so you don't have way to detect this, this, this rotation. And that's why for this, like, my classification okay. thing, uh, if you don't have rotation, you don't have this information. So, so you're saying your definition is the detector detail, uh, returns the scale like uh, rotation and translation. Uh, uh, my definition is uh, detector returns our some geometric information. And then this is the question is how rich is this information and how it is invariant or covariant or factors. Yeah. But uh, yes, you are completely right that you can look at it from like uh, other side. Okay, let's uh, go with for step by step. Do you, by the way, do you know the reference? Uh, so there is this, uh, uh, stuff like we have GPT-3 networks which do uh, language modeling and they are kind of dealership learning. You, you write some kind of prompt and they, it answers question. And it turns out that uh, if you write some kind of logical or mathematical question, then if you just add, let's do it step by step, the accuracy increases significantly. So that is like really, really black magic there. And I love that I work with kind of uh, a little bit grounded geometry. Okay, key point location, how, how, how can we get them? The, uh, the most of the detectors, although not all, they are response-based, which means that we have image, uh, we calculate some kind of response function, whatever. Like we can imagine many, many response functions. Uh, none, not all of them are good. We actually can say, okay, my pixel intensity is response function. Okay, fine. Uh, so, so then we find local maxima there because uh, we need to like well localize points. Otherwise, if you can uh, localize it locally, you cannot localize it at all. And then uh, we can take, okay, uh, I'm going for top K or I'm threshold in my image. Both, uh, both uh, things have like their pros and cons. So, um, okay, so that's like a general thing. What is the response function? Great question. Here is a response function. Uh, I'm not going to be too much here into the formulas. However, I can do, go well, here is Hessian, Harris, or superponent response. Hessian, uh, response so you build you calculate image gradients uh, and you build second order metrics and then you get like determinant minus k trace of this matrix uh, per each pixel that would be Harris response a Hessian response uh, you get second order gradients so like you build Hessian uh, for each pixels 
for the image gradients, and then you go for the determinant of session. Or in, in Lima, these are firing on blobs. For example, on Harris and Hessian, they're typically activated by blobs. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So Hessian is like blob detector. Harris is kind of corner detector, but not as a corner as a junction, but things which are easily localizable in both directions. Or you can be pretty much like uh, like whatever, like super point, for example, it's uh, very cool and famous now, uh, deep learning based detector. And uh, a, its response function is basically output of our uh, deep neural network. And to, okay, it's basically the same. So we have this response map. And by the way, for super point response, I really played with the contrast because otherwise you, you just see a point there. Okay, now we do non-maximum suppression. In Hessian response, there is some formula. Yes. So which comes from the gradient. And in super point response, is there some formula or is it just- It is uh, the output of uh, deep network, like which you just style input image output. Like uh, you can think about this as a segmentation network where two plus segmentation network, no key point and yes key point. That's your two classes. And there are many, many other networks like uh, RT, D2, uh, DISC, I think these three are like the best uh, around some of the learn detectors. And uh, if you need formula, you can uh, look up this. What I'm trying to do like is uh, how much information I have and how we, how we use it. Okay, so we do non-maximum suppression, which means that we go by three by three window and uh, like through all the image. And if the center pixel is not maximum, we delete it. That's very simple. And here, uh, what would be if we uh, visualize our uh, all the local maxima and you can see that it's indeed do does like, uh, as some key points. So for example, like corners, some contrast, the things, and actually they're like pretty much similar. Ah, by the way, KeyNet is another deep network. Uh, and right now I think they look like pretty similar uh, in terms of, okay, uh, and that is reasonable because what uh, they need to do is find some localizable structures. Although they are, if you, for example, look for the super point, there is nothing in this uh, circular window. And here you have uh, for Hessian and Keen and uh, some things. Uh, so right now, uh, people usually think about non-maximum suppression in other way, because like for object detection, and for object detection, we have kind of similar thing. We have multiple hypotheses where our object is, and probably there are not uh, tens of horses and uh, people there. If they're nearby cluster, it's related to same object, and you want to process and combine them and get one the best. And it's usually based on the stuff like intersection over union or maybe another uh, deep learning methods to merge them and so on. So that's uh, that is kind of uh, like a different approach, uh, but also the same. Uh, different in terms of the we operate in different terms, uh, but the same is okay. We would like to localize uh, entity around like multiple nearby representation of it. And why we can do just uh, like this uh, three by three filtering, because we know that our uh, size of local feature is uh, like fixed and we don't have any kind of other properties. So we, we can just filter by response. Uh, but it would be uh, like, it would be interesting maybe to uh, say, okay, maybe we can do something better. Okay, now we can have key points, but that's uh, actually not true. We don't have only key points right now. We have something more because each filter uh, for that, like it can be linear filter as for DOG. So this is just a blob for difference of Gaussian or for uh, Harris or Hessian filters we have, or for the CNN, we have receptive field. Therefore we have some kind of scale like this. Uh, so e each of uh, key points have uh, at least uh, like a uh, rough associated scale there. And where for Hessian, like, or Harris, like classical uh, functions, they are like pretty exact, they are, are related to sigmoid to which of, of uh, uh, sorry, no sigmoid, sigma of uh, Gaussian derivative you used to do this, bigger sigma 
uh, bigger response. Uh, for super point, we can so okay, we can just calculate receptive field of the uh, network. So how much it sees, and say okay, this would be my scale. Uh, same for Kinet. So you're telling that the scale comes from, somehow from the neural network, but hacking detectors they're designed like purely mathematically. So uh, yes. Does the scale come from detectors? Uh, so I see also another questions, but uh, I thought okay. I was not prepared to answer questions about Hessian, but I can just do it really, really fast. Okay. So, um, okay, that's a course of on computer vision I'm doing. Here is population, Harris corners. Okay, great. Uh, okay, 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 okay. Um, let's uh, let's start with this. We have uh, Harris detector. Hessian is actually very similar, but and you have kind of uh, okay. That's even before Harris. Uh, the idea, if you would like to well localize something. Uh, which means it should be uh, the center of our patch. We say, okay, here is key point. It need to be different in both uh, in all directions. And actually, if you use image gradient, it's enough. It would be localizable in x and y direction. Great. So, uh, which means that we can do it super naively. We can uh, just uh, calculate the difference of small neighborhood of the between center of this patch. And to like uh, all the neighborhood patches. So this is the formula. Uh, and okay, we can use some of some of square distance differences, also weighted, weighted by something. And weighted, it's good because we would like to do it like really locally. Are you still with me? So given we are fixed, and I take the sum to all x, y in. In the neighborhood, okay, of the yes, point. yes, okay, okay. So and then, so that would be see how how we different from the like patches nearby, and then we can go for maximum there. That's uh, pretty simple, right? Now, uh, the question is, uh, and. That we would like to be also kind of uh, okay. The I'm going uh, pretty forward, but okay, you you ask that I'm answering. So and then you can imagine this image really zoom out, right? So very very small building, but there is this still rooftop corner. Okay, uh, then uh, we would like to uh, so and then uh, if you would like to localize with the same the small size image like I don't know five by five seven by seven uh, in this zoomed out image in the zoom in image like this it would be like huge maybe like 30 by 30 pixels right okay uh, which means that we can uh, use uh, bigger neighborhood to detect uh, by bigger features like we are simulating uh, stuff to do for zoom in so and uh, this comes from the size of our this neighborhood, this uh, uh, from where U and V goes, and uh, the same as uh, can be for this uh, W. This defines your scale of the uh, local feature. Okay. Uh, okay. Coming back. Okay, so, uh, but that would, was a constant scale. So, okay, we know the size of filter we use, we know the receptive field of CNN and so on, fine. So, but uh, if you would like to work with, uh, get like real scale for work with zoom out and zoom in, we need to detect scale. And uh, what we can do, there are like uh, several ways of doing this, naive way and less naive way. And uh, for linear filters and like 
near linear like headstand. Uh, so what we can do is uh, gradually blur our image and construct a Gaussian pyramid as here. And then we can run the same um, <clears throat> process, not in uh, like when we do maximum, when we look for the maximum and in X, Y, they do for non-maximum suppression, we also can look for maximum uh, around these blurred levels. And uh, the maximum would actually correspond to the size of our detected blob because the response would be the maximum. You can think about this, especially with uh, DOG difference of Gaussian filter, as you have template of the blob uh, from smaller to bigger template. You apply this template and find we, which, whichever fits better. And, and we do this non-maximum suppression in this uh, uh, scale space, which gives us a sigma, uh, which corresponds to the size of our blob, size of our local feature. If we would like to be even more precise, and we are sure that it's uh, assumption that our filters are linear or and uh, uh, behave well there, we can even interpolate their maximum using, uh, for example, like a uh, Taylor expansion around th that point and uh, go for like uh, interpolating extrema. And that is uh, why uh, classical local features like SIFT are so precise because they do uh, they think in X, Y and scale direction. And this gives you like uh, really pr precise local features, which uh, currently deep net lacking. Okay. Now, as you can see that for Hessen, we have uh, like different blobs. And for example, especially you see, this is really, really nice blob in, uh, here. So, so, so like it's uh, detecting uh, uh, blobs well, it's a little bit shifted because we have also, it's, it's uh, not really circle, it is uh, a bit ellipse, but what we can do for learning detectors. Okay, there are like several strategies for doing it. Uh, yeah, By the way, you ha you, someone has a question which I forgot, no? Okay. Uh, okay, first denial. We say, okay, you all have no scale, which means that, no, no, no. We forget about this uh, and we just output X and Y. That's actually what uh, most of the learned local features do. Uh, because it, right now people usually work with point correspondences and they say, okay, for super point or for disk, uh, we give you X, Y in descriptor, what, what else you want? You, you, people usually want this scale to get the descriptor, but deep network also put your descriptor, so you have X, Y and that's it. We don't care. Okay. And it's uh, actually uh, works well in terms of uh, first, uh, you need to do this to be scale covariant to have a good descriptor. Otherwise, you cannot make a uh, cross scale change. Uh, so, if your receptive field is large enough, then network can figure out. And if you have large uh, data, for example, disk is trained on mega depths, which is like what million images. So, pretty pretty good. Anger, you say, okay, uh, we won't scale, but uh, we cannot use this uh, nice uh, Gaussian pyramid. So we are doing the brute force. Uh, and by brute force, we construct scale pyramid, but not in Gaussian sense, but in sense of we have uh, just downscaled images like two times or square root of two times, uh, and we run detector there and just keep all key points. That's how ORP features do, that's how KeyNet features do and so on. Uh, it is good, it gives your scale covariance. But at first, it's uh, still up to the precision of your like this discretization step of the scale pyramid. And second, it is uh, you have multiple detections uh, here, as you can see. For example, if it's especially if it's very good and robust uh, learned local features, you have uh, as keynet you have many, many, many nested detections, which are corresponding to basically the same key point. With different scale, okay, that's 
uh, good, but maybe it's uh, it's too dense. Maybe we need to have more discretized pyramid, but then we have less correct estimate of this uh, scale per point. So there is a trade-off, but it works like uh, reasonably well. Uh, and a third acceptance that, okay, we would like to do scale. What can we do? We either can learn and to output the scale, which nobody does. So if you would like to publish paper here, uh, basically the idea, uh, but uh, there, there is, you can actually use a kind of patch and by patch, I mean not image patch, but patch as a uh, like fixing thing and use some kind of third party scale estimator, uh, which is, uh, for example, there are uh, papers on BMVC 21, this CVPR, which uh, do exactly this. They take patch centered at the key point and output uh, distribution of scales. You pick So that would be. So you start, you initialize with some constant scale because you need to extract patch and then you get correction factor. Uh, and this uh, works actually reasonably well. Uh, the, this uh, people, uh, authors of the paper say that it helps uh, when you take uh, learned local descriptors like super point, uh, which don't have scale and fit them into other lamp which really likes, this is a much filtering strategy, by the way, by Thorsten. And uh, they, what they do is say, okay, they use scale to filter out incorrect correspondences. And this uh, like external information is like uh, helping them. Uh, however, there are like several problems. First is uh, if you establish, uh, for example, you take super point, you have X, Y, and descriptor, you establish correspondence. You, you are sure that this X, Y correspondence is really be between this X and Y. However, if you detect scale externally and still use the same descriptors, you are no longer sure that this actually uh, scale is also corresponding. Uh, you can actually use another descriptor like budget descriptor like hardness, softness and so on, but it uh, might be suboptimal. Uh, and uh, usually for this pertain scale detectors, uh, uh, for other kind of either they're like human detected key points or, or DOG, which is a detector in SIFT. So, that, and if you use something trained on DOG to super point, it might be not optimal. Okay, so we are buying uh, saying goodbye to super point because we cannot uh, like really rely to this stuff. But if uh, another opportunity for a paper uh, have a super point which also gives full a fine uh, shape, which should be scale uh, orientation and a fine shape, it would be like pretty nice. And uh, it would have uh, its applications. Okay, now we have Hessian, which is classical and uh, uh, key in detection. Orientation. What we can do with orientation? Actually, we have already orientation. Uh, we can say, okay, we rely on photographer. Uh, up as a prior, so all our features are gravity oriented. And if you work with outdoor data, it's very often it's very reasonable assumption. Yeah, or if you do with like some kind of rubber ground robot, but it uh, is not reasonable assumption when you work with UAV and looking down. So all the kind of of rotation. Uh, okay, that's. Uh... I'm not going to comment this, this slide a lot, but the main idea that if you're sh sure that you can rely on photographer, rely on photographer is much better than detecting. Well, yes. So what do we mean here by orientation? Oh, great. Uh, so uh, imagine you have uh, this image and the uh, landscape version where uh, your exif in a uh, camera did not work, okay? Uh, so we have this image and the scape version of the same image. Now we are on our detection. We have so this uh, key point and we just, uh, crop it out and then use some kind of descriptor, or six, whatever. Okay. Uh, the uh, thing is that if this patches would be rotated 90 degrees, the descriptors would be ways too different and you would not be able to match them to get correct correspondences, even if it's the same image just rotated 90 degrees. Uh, that means 
that uh, when we have some kind of measurement region here, we also have uh, orientation associated with this patch, with this uh, measurement region. And this is like the orientation. Good question. So one was say, okay, we rely on photography. What, what if we cannot do this? We can detect some kind of canonical orientation. Uh, and one of the classical ways how to do it, and this uh, works really well, is uh, we calculate image gradients. Like very simple, we maybe even already have calculated them for detection of uh, Hessian or, or Harris points, whatever. And then we uh, we have x and y for and e in each pixel, like uh, gradient x, gradient y. We can convert this to polar representation, which means magnitude and orientation, and then we histogram them all over the patch, and you have histogram of our orientation, and then we and each uh, pixel voted with its magnitude. So and then we pick some maximum in this histogram. And this is like illustrated this orientation from uh, dark to light. If we rotate patch, it's still uh, covariant. So that's that's classical approach. And this is how it works on two example, like ideally. How it works on non two example, although like uh, so this from our e building at Karlov and MST, it works. Well, although you can see there is some misalignment between the like patches oriented with this rotation just because we have some differences in XY or uh, or this occlusion or whatever. Okay, so that's one way of doing this. Uh, there are other ways uh, of doing this. Some are good, some are bad. Uh, if you have like just a very specific key points, then you can actually design very specific orientation detection for them. Uh, here is for orb local features, uh, which detects uh, not just corners, but basically sectors of light uh, and around is dark, or sectors of dark and around is white. And then you can uh, treat it as a, uh, that you have light is a mass, and you find the center of the mass of this light part, and you would like to orient this, uh, for example, horizontally or vertically. And as you can see, like it is, uh, if you rotate uh, the patch, it would also be rotated well, so it's, it's reasonable, but it works only for these kind of key points. Or, or you can be more general and learn orientation estimator or in it, which is like uh, very simple and you can get infinite data for this. So you have image, you sample patches from, from it, you rotate the patches, uh, and you feed these uh, patches into neural network, which outputs your angle. And angle is, uh, you don't know canonical orientation. And actually that's what you would like to know. What is the canonical orientation? Uh, and in your loss function, you say, okay, I penalize for uh, misalignment when I represent back to original image. So basically it learns to detect whatever it is, but it, you consistently, and it works uh, actually better than this classical uh, dominant gradient uh, estimation. However, it uh, has no kind of obvious explainability or interpretability. So uh, here is a result on this for example, that, okay, we have this weird, I don't know, 30 degrees or, 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 or whatever, but they are aligned, uh, same as here. Uh, but the benefit of this is that it's more robust and actually more precise. So mis misalignment of this uh, to patches below is lower than for the ingredient orientation. Okay, now, uh, and as you can see, they looking like quite, uh, sometimes it's the same, sometimes uh, very differently. But okay, now you have X, Y and orientation and for many uh, cases it's actually good enough. And the shameless plug there, that's uh, all, all the local features before, which I told you about except super point, are available in Cornea, which is OpenCV in PyTorch. 
you have many of these classical algorithms like Hessian, Harris, they are all differentiable. You can back props through them, um, uh, like many, many, many things. And uh, like I'm using it every day in teaching and research. And uh, I love promoting this because I think it's a good thing. Uh, okay, going back. Uh, one more thing is uh, that what we uh, have had just before uh, for the orientation network, uh, what I said is that you take two patches and you output some rotation and you want it to be consistent. However, some patches are symmetrical. And when you train regressor, which regress only uh, one output, uh, that you, you cannot deal with symmetries. Uh, and they're like more uh, recent work, uh, they treat it similarly to this classical uh, dominant gradient orientation. Uh, in that sense, they also output a, a histogram or distribution of the uh, orientations and uh, they put their laws on these distributions uh, to match. This allows you to have multiple orientations per feature for a symmetrical object. Um, okay, there are several papers about this, uh, and uh, I'm not going to deeply how they work. Uh, uh, I, I'm here to uh, give you main idea, and if you would need this, you will uh, go and, and learn how they work. Okay, I find shape. Now we have X and Y, and scale and orientation, nice. But we are not fully done. Uh, there are multiple ways of estimating uh, ellipse shape uh, around uh, features. And again, you can think about if you have letter O and it's on wall which you are looking at the angle, it would be no longer a circle, it would be ellipse. Uh, so classical way how to do this is uh, calculate uh, second moment matrix, same way as you would do there for Harris corner detector. And then, uh, again, similarly to what we do for the uh, dominant gradient orientation, uh, we can integrate this uh, second moment matrix per patch. Uh, that would be uh, that would give us uh, two by two matrix, which is symmetrical, and then uh, uh, out of this we can get our uh, like uh, this actually second moment matrix is. Uh, changing covariantly with the geometrical transformation of the patch. So uh, what you want to do is to, if you apply inverse of this matrix, then you would have uh, transformation to the circular patch okay, in the canonical space. And here, how it would work. For example, uh, we have detected the here window, which is uh, a little bit elongated. Uh, we get a second moment matrix. We say, okay, we have more gradients in this direction than in other, and we would like to have uh, the directions in X and Y uh, to be equal and uh, as little as possible in the X, Y. So here it is. The benefit of this is that it's like really uh, improves your viewpoint uh, robustness for a whole system for image matching. The best thing to do is imagine you have a weird uh, uh, architecture where you have square windows and rectangular windows. Then if you apply this uh, transformation, all your windows in a patch space would be uh, square windows. So you're gaining an invariance, but you're lacking discriminability. It's always this trade-off. Okay. Uh, you, we can also do a little bit uh, uh, more. We also can apply a deep network for estimating this, but it's not easy as uh, for uh, orientation because uh, when you change this ellipse, you also change the uh, area of this uh, local feature, and you also really, really change the distortion, which you have at pixels, which would be like really blurred or something. So we need to do something more clever. So we would like to go about how we learn local feature descriptor, which is kind of standard image matching 
sorry, uh, metric learning task. And the same that we would like to learn embeddings of the similar uh, things in our context of similarity to be nearby in descriptor space and for, for non similar, they should be far. And by similar here, we mean uh, corresponding to the same location in 3D, and we do this. So, this is this way how people learn. Uh, uh, local feature descriptors or other descriptors, contrastive laws, strict lit laws, like all over the, uh, the literature. Uh, that's uh, pretty simple. And the question is, why cannot we use this uh, for learn our affine shape in order to guide our matching? And the answer is yes, we absolutely can. So, yes. So, in the previous slide, how do we, how do we choose A1, B1, the, the lower case, A1, B1? A lower case, okay, we are not choose. Uh, this is output of our neural network. And yes. So, so, but we are learning it. So we are learning it via stochastic gradient descent, optimizing a loss, which is on the next slide. So in the next slide, you will choose how to fit the training data set to, to, to learn this neural network. Okay, so that's a different uh, question. So uh, question is, how you like not small but uh, big A's you mean right? No, and B's. Small. Wait wait wait. This is big. This is small. Yes, I mean small. Uh, wait. If you are going for data set, you're operating here. So the neural network will take as an input patch, and output some descriptor, right? Descriptor is small a and b, and uh, the big a and b are patches. So what is your question? So A and Bs are just points in R2 in that case, or these are some regions in R2? Uh, good question. <clears throat> so they are local features. And what we have before, uh, be before we get to the affine uh, shape, we have X, Y, scale, and orientation. And this A and B, they are patches around some 3D location. And on image, we have X, Y scale and orientation, which results in this kind of patch. So, so the detection is in the inner space. It's normalized. And then that's what that, after that normalization, you have this A1 and B1, right? Is this correct? Yes. Uh, so or if we, OK. Well, OK, so, so the, we take these guys. We use some kind of detector. And we, we get these regions. Here are the circles, but okay, we can do squares and we resize them to uh, same size of patch, usually like 32 by 32. Does it answer your question? <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so, so, so okay, uh, to learn this, we, yes, we need uh, some data set, and usually we have some 3D model, which means we have. Uh, uh, images with known positions, we have depth information, then we know on um, which pixels corresponds to uh, which location and 3D space. And then we can, uh, that's why we can sample like corresponding patches for this uh, A1, uh, A1, B1, A2, B2. And so indexes uh, means like image index. Uh, no, sorry, A and B, they are, are like. Uh, image index and one to three are patch index. Okay, so we sample them. And uh, then we minimize some kind, uh, kind of detection, not that uh, important, but metric learning loss. You would like to find such embeddings when you're learning descriptor to, to be the patches in descriptor space uh, to be similar where are uh, coming from same studio location. And if not, then no. Uh, the question how we can use this to learn geometric information? And the answer is, OK, we need a, a like, if you have whole pipeline differentiable, then we can do the following. First, we, are, we have we sample pairs of patches which correspond to some location, you know, same location. Then we uh, apply a random geometric transform to them, uh, which is the P1, P1 dot. Uh, then we, we crop it, just like just technicality, and we feed these patches into AFNET, uh, and this AFNET should output our like elliptical shape, canonical shape. Uh, it outputs us something. 
well, what we do is you use this something, these parameters into the, uh, to work the patches uh, using these predicted geometrical parameters. And we get this uh, output. As, as you can see, they're like not that much similar yet. And what is important, we use this via spatial transformer, which is basically differentiable image working. Um, then we go through another neural network or classical detector like SIFT, implemented in a differentiable way again. And we use this uh, metric learning loss. Uh, and then we freeze the descriptor. Descriptor does not change. I mean, descriptor in terms of network or SIFT. Uh, and we back propagate these to our AFNET so that, like, if you think about this, it needs to uh, find uh, this uh, shape, which uh, makes uh, the metric learning task easier. And uh, ideally, what does it mean? It, so it outputs our uh, canonical orientation, uh, sorry, canonical shape, such that it would be the same than when the, uh, sorry, when the patches would be transformed as here, uh, then they should look maximally the same. Then, it, uh, then the loss would be small. So if you have, yes. Yeah, and also this was a point like that the positive pair is uh, two patches which are closed, and the negative is just uh, 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 Good question. Uh, so that is, uh, I, I didn't uh, want to uh, uh, like uh, put emphasis there, but negative pair is actually, we are not sample this, we calculate uh, descriptor distance, everything to everything. And we pick the hardest negative. Uh, hardest negative, which means this is the most close to our input patches, but we know that there could be no in our batch. There is no uh, same patches except these two. The all others are our pools of negatives and we per each mini batch, we pick the hardest one and you use this. So in each batch, you calculate the distance in latent space and the... Exactly. Okay, now, so, so and the, it works. However, it's very unstable. And uh, the, there is, uh, like, when we looked out why, so on this, uh, this kind of um, visualization, hard negative. Uh, so what's going on on this GIF? Okay. Okay. Oh, we have the. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, same color means uh, corresponding to same location, and here this is kind of uh, two example, and this is descriptor space. And in descriptor space, so uh, we optimize uh, their location so that uh, same color goes together, and they repulse uh, other colors. As but as you can see, uh, the just stand near each other and uh, uh, the optimization is like really hard here. So, so because uh, um, they put into each other way. So what we can do instead, we can modify loss. Uh, and this is hard next C loss. We can say, okay, our loss is still the same. We would like to, uh, the same color go together, the other colors go not together, but uh, we don't propagate loss to the negative example from this triplet, which means that uh, these pairs want to escape from these guys, but they not push it, and that's why they are not interfering with each other, and then it fixes the whole optimization process. Yes. So you don't have the negatives there in this? We have negatives. Uh, but we stop gradient to flow. So loss is still would be impacted by them and uh, positive pairs together would like to go from negative, but they would not push their negative. Uh, okay, so one, one more technical thing is when, when you work with geometry, and deep learning, the parameterization is really, really important. So for a fine shape, you know, there are multiple ways how you can parameterize. It's, uh, for example, four parameters, just no constraints here, or it can be, you can decompose this for rotation and a fine shape. 
uh, or you can say, okay, uh, the circular shape is actually quite quite good. Uh, and uh, let, let it be our default. What we do, this is basically a ResNet trick, and we learn only correction to this uh, circular shape. And then we, and this uh, works the best. Whereas if you try to optimize for simultaneously uh, orientation and a fine shape uh, in non decomposed way, it just does not converge. You can probably do something about this, but you can just change your uh, parameterization. Sa same, for example, goes for if you try to regress like six depots, like rotation, orientation. And the question is how you uh, represent rotation in 3D work. Would it be Euler matrix? Would it be angle axis, like this, or would it be quaternions? Usually, quaternions are the best uh, things to optimize for. And so it's the same as gold here. Now, so what does this, matrix represent? Um, this represents uh, shape. OK, let, let's go here. Uh, so this represents uh, this uh, elliptical shape plus uh, orientation, which means that uh, if we have patch, this is like rectangular 32 by 32, which we use. Uh, how we uh, how coordinates in this patch related to coordinates in original image from where we extracted this. So um, uh, the answer is uh, by this uh, fine matrix, and you also have which is not here x and y location. So for example, to get the uh, how this oh, where where are my patches. Patches. For example, how the coordinate in this page, like zero, zero, corresponds to where it is here. So uh, you multiply its coordinates in homogeneous uh, version by this A matrix, and you go here. So the coordinates in the homogeneous version is a three by one version. Mm -hmm. Then how can I multiply it by a two by two matrix? <sighs> Good question. You have to homogenize the affine matrix. So. Yes. So Answer you is uh, okay. Again, so, so, so we have actually here is two by two, but we also emit it because its shape is already centered on the feature. We also have X and Y if you would like to go for co 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 image coordinates, right? We have now two by three. We have, and then we uh, homogenize as the same as the X, Y, we have zero, zero, one. Here we go, we have three by three matrix. It's an affine basis. For, for that reason, essentially, you can modify it. So the position of or the center of the feature because you have the location of where that feature is and you have the okay. shape. And then you concatenate the position on the third column and you concatenate zero, zero, 001 on the third row. OK, now here is how it looks. And as you can see, yes. So this is what I get in the end with this matrix, this homogenized version. Yes. If I have my coordinate of this ellipse in the first picture, and I like apply this matrix, I will get the coordinate in the second picture. Uh, yeah. oh, if you use affine correspondences, then yes. If if you uh, like, if you detect here here and you uh, this affine transformation from these and this matrix, you multiply this uh, by this invert, and then yes. The, uh, but like original, this like just if you detect in single image, it means that how you uh, project to the canonical space of this normalized space. You have to change them. So you go A inverse, which takes you to the normalized space, then you go A, which takes you back into the second. Uh, okay, so this classical method and the uh, AFNET actually looks surprisingly similar. Uh, although we did not impose any constraint to be okay initialized from uh, like classical the second moment matrix on something but network learned very very similar stuff which is like amazing it's probably like pretty optimal already however there is a little the change uh, like little difference so these two top row are uh, distorted uh, version of the uh, same location in image uh, this is uh, second moment magic like classical rectification applied, and, and this like rectified it pretty well, although not fully. But for AFNET, it's a little bit better. And in image space, it actually looks like really, really good. And this is what was network was optimized. However, 
uh, that uh, and uh, so, so here what we can uh, observe so we have transformation rectifying transformation from one rectifying transformation for another exa applying exactly this uh, procedure that uh, James said and like in ideal case we would have here identity metrics, which means that we ideally found uh, the same rectification independently. But as you can see, it's not, it's not. Uh, and for Offnet, it is uh, closer to original, uh, closer to identity, but not quite. Which means that if you use this for patch normalization, it's good. But if you use it as geometrical information, you need to uh, kind of account to this uh, noise. Okay, so that is how we have response-based uh, local feature detector and how we can upgrade to get uh, locally defined features. And then if you match them with descriptors, we get corresponding. But not uh, that that is not always how you can do this. There are like um, forgotten uh, now, but maybe will be revived again with uh, deep learning, like other ideas. Uh, imagine you have segmented some kind of region. It can be, uh, it can be like intensity, it can be uh, MSR or whatever. So you have control. You have some control. Now you can from center of the gravity of this uh, control, uh, you can uh, cast trace. Uh, uh, so sorry, sorry, sorry. That's uh, I'm going a little bit forward. How to get a, a fine normalization? Here it is a different thing. This is how you can detect regions, and this is a really cool idea because here uh, we detect uh, basically we have a fine transformation, and the fine transformation is. Uh, uh, like local approximation of homography is good, but that's uh, pretty limited. If we detect like uh, regions consistently, it can give us more information. So what we can do is uh, from each uh, pixel, we can go, uh, we can have 1D response function, similar as we had 2D response function for image before, 1D, and we go into each direction until we get some peak. And we uh, write down the coordinates of this peak. And this gives us this region. And uh, the, the nice thing about this, that its region is uh, changing covariantly with image. And it can be, it's actually more than covariant with uh, a fine. If you uh, warp with homography, perspective transform still would be perspective covariant. So that's very nice, although it's quite uh, costly to detect. Um, now, if you would like to get a fine uh, feature out of this, you would, you don't know how to work with uh, regions, or you just don't need this. Uh, you, you need something to plug into your fine runtime, for example. Uh, you can fit uh, second moment metrics to this region as well and get your fine feature. Uh, okay, and uh, like th th this can be done uh, like by what I mean, like to fit in uh, matrix. Uh, this is also can go for second order moments, uh, which would be a fine covariant. Okay, so it's not that important. And th there is another way that I, I really like this kind of detector. It was like really dominant for several years in computer vision, and it was super useful for text detection. And this is uh, called MSR, which is uh, a pretty simple idea. You start thresholding with the image by some, uh, some threshold. You, you start from uh, down, from zero, or you start from top, from 255. And then you just uh, have, okay, we have region inside, or we like to have light blob and dark blob. So your threshold, this is above, this is below. And you keep thresholding, changing your threshold. And the thing is that sometimes uh, the um, uh, area uh, would not be changing. Why well, it's not going again? Ah, okay, it's frozen, something nice. 
Maybe just a part of it. Um, it seems that it's like completely dead. Uh, it doesn't work. Can I? Ah. Okay. Uh, uh -huh, nice. Sorry for this. Uh, okay. Let me. Let me find it again. Where is this? Documents, documents, presentations, yes. This one. No. Okay, I, I would not show you this video again. Uh, I'll try to do another one. I think, I hope it would not kill us. Does it work? Hmm, doesn't look like it working. Uh, last time it worked actually. Somehow I, I usually show this in my lecture. Something is going, but it doesn't. Okay, 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 nice. Okay, this is uh, the same process in image space. So you have this, uh, and you go from light to dark and from dark to light. And as you can see that uh, some region does not change their shape when you change their threshold or that threshold. And this means that you have a stable region and you would like to keep this region and say, okay, this is, uh, this is my control I have detected and then I can reset them as much as I like. Uh, for example, here, uh, the, the benefit of this is this, uh, they are really, really stable with respect to viewpoint change. Much more than like any kind of learned or a classical local feature detector. And then you, uh, you, you see second moment metrics here, for example, and you have your local feature. It's, it's still pretty useful uh, Messier detector. But you actually can do much more. If you have uh, some kind of region and you have a contour and uh, you can find many kind of points of the contour uh, from which you can construct your local affine frame. And local affine frame is only one representation that we have X, Y, scale, rotation, and shape. Uh, it can be also three points because oriented ellipse can be defined by three points. And we need to just select uh, three points here on this contour. For example, it can be uh, points of our uh, concavity or convexity and uh, connect them in Y on one or another way. Uh, the benefit of doing this is that it, they are much more precise than the fitted uh, fine matrix because they have basically pixel level of precision. Um, and that's uh, like, I, I really like the paper. And, and this is just to show you how many different properties on the contour you can use to construct this kind of uh, local affine frames. For example, you have many, many points and this is not all of them. And then you combine like this, this and this, or you can combine this, this and that, and so on. The benefit of this, you have actually multiple uh, local affine frames uh, from one region, which you, but they are also connected. So you, you can use this for your run part, you can use for estimation you plane and many, many other things. Uh, okay, that's paper. Okay, but there is, should be a catch. If it's like so cool, so nice, everyone would be using it. And now the people don't use it much. So here is um, why. Uh, this is a benchmark uh, we did uh, two years ago for image matching in large scale. And uh, the, uh, we tested image matching pipeline as a whole. We have like images and outputs is relative pose between cameras. And what we did is we changed in detector 
and say, okay, if the detector is better, then the camera pulse accuracy should go up. And, and then uh, that is the camera pulse accuracy here, and DOG is detector in C, and actually it was gold standard. And it is actually very reasonable why it's gold standard. It's in real world data, it performs uh, the best. For example, MSR performs not very well. Uh, why so? Although it's so robust uh, for viewpoint changes and we have huge viewpoint changes. The problem is that, yes, it is robust to viewpoint change, but it's very brittle with respect to occlusion, which we can, you have contour and you have uh, now branch and it breaks these contours into two. So now you have no way to measure this two to one. Uh, and also how much the fine information help uh, with respect to the, like just uh, in, in, like, like, that's like standard thing. And uh, the answer is a little bit. It uh, helps a little bit. Uh, however, sometimes it's like really critical. It's uh, if you can register this image to this to the model or not. And that is if you're using this uh, fine normalization Oh, uh, there's a fine shape just to get your better descriptor, which is viewpoint uh, uh, more robust. Uh, and there are like more ways how to use this fine information, which I was uh, talking uh, originally. Now, okay, this I would probably uh, not pretend that I understand this paper, but I I really like the method. And it was actually uh, was giving a very good result in image retrieval because before deep learning came, those uh, alpha, uh, alpha weighted alpha shapes. And the thing is, after you detected some kind of edges and contour, you can connect them, uh, get in some kind of uh, space uh, triangulation like Delanet, but a little bit different. And then you go uh, up, 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 and you'll find some kind of stable. Uh, points and shapes, and it's uh, more or less robust to pixel noise, like Gaussian or and it's also kind of pretty interpretable. It's blob detector and also kind of shape detector. Okay, now we are not yet done. There are multiple, uh, uh, like there are many ideas, which actually the same for classical features and for deep learning things. In deep learning, everyone know what is test time augmentation or just augmentation. Uh, when you just randomly like flip or maybe you have uh, a fine change of the image and then, uh, or like scale, you get many multiple versions of this image and then you average your prediction classification and you get your like plus one percentage of accuracy. The same can actually work for the local features, although it's from a different perspective. So imagine you have just a circle or like without it assigned information, just as if you have X, Y scale and orientation. What you can do instead, you can transform image. And uh, thinking that this is like uh, our front of parallel view and we're simulating and they're looking on it from different points on the view sphere. We detect a local feature there, uh, the circular in uh, the transformed image, but when we back project them to the original image, they become a fine. They, and they, this gives your also benefit, unlike the original like uh, this AFNET or a fine shape that it also can adapt for XY detector. For example, uh, you would be able to detect those points which you are not able to detect by your just response function or whatever. So, and this is a uh, way how you sample this uh, view sphere. So, for example, the more uh, tilted view, uh, the more you need to uh, sample from here, but here you can actually sample pretty sparse. Um, one important thing, if you are going this way, and by the way, so this is this is cool because it also works for any learn de deep learning features. You can do this transformation and you improve their robustness for this kind of uh, transformation a lot. That's very easy trick, but uh, only problem is computational complexity. Uh, when you do this transformation, don't forget to add anti-aliasing blur because the more you change your image, 
uh, then um, you, uh, which means that you have anisotropic scaling. Like for example, if you're downscaling image uh, just uh, using bilinear interpolation, you would get uh, severe artifacts. And if you do this downscale anisotropically, so what, like usually how you can uh, find these artifacts, you first blur your image, then your downscale, and this is according to Nyquist theory. Great, uh, but uh, you cannot just apply Gaussian blur here. You need to do it dir directed in the direction of the biggest uh, anisotropic scale change. So this is uh, a little bit uh, of trick here. However, it can be easily done by first rotating images in this direction and say, okay, we apply just horizontally standard uh, 1D Gaussian blur. That's uh, not all the way how we can do this. Uh, the ACIST method is, is great, but it's super slow. It is extremely slow, but it's quite robust. And we can do it uh, a little bit better. Actually, uh, again, I'm referring to Thurston paper here. Uh, so what you can do is you can say, okay, the, we probably want, if you have some planes, to look at them from the front of parallel view, detect features nicely, everyone would be happy. So how we can do this? We can leverage uh, CNNs, which do monocular depth estimation. Uh, then you get the normals from the depths. You cluster them. This is uh, this direction, this direction, and... And you also have a segmentation here, which is important. You don't need to uh, change whole image um, because it would probably, it's already uh, have a scale in this way. You don't want to uh, scale it in this way even more. But for other plane, it would be other way around. So, so you use this, so you segment some parts of images, you apply some kind of rectification transformation here, or you can do more of that. It's depending of uh, how how you do this, and uh, you detect there and uh, apply uh, just like standard image matching techniques. What is interesting here is that it was like first work in this direction, saying okay, we segment it with one depth. And uh, my master student, uh, now a researcher at Prague University, so we said okay, we can do better. Maybe we can. Uh, use afnet density, which uh, estimates a fine shape uh, per pixel. And we would have basically the same rectifying transformation uh, there, but without using mono depths. And we, we can cluster this. And uh, uh, the benefit of this is usually use like uh, less distorted views output as a homography. And also afnet was changed for improving mesh. Uh, okay, that was uh, one big block or a second big block, how you can get uh, local affine correspondences, which mean you detect affine something and then you link them and now you have affine correspondence. But there is another way. You can upgrade the point correspondence to affine. So because when you have just a point correspondence or like similarity covariant correspondence, which is an uh, adding fifth here, uh, so the patches are roughly similar anyway, but you are just like in this uh, more precise uh, geometric information and you like the estimation of this. But if you have them already, uh, you say you have much it, uh, stuff, and then you would like to find the uh, lo local correspondence. What you can do, uh, you can do many things. First, you can try to uh, differentiably register the patches and find the transformations. That's one like optimization based way you can minimize uh, square uh, distance, some of square distance, you can minimize some descriptor, or you can uh, take these two patches and feed them into neural network as usual nowadays, which outputs your, uh, your transformation, which can be a fine or it can be even homography because you can uh, output like four points. And that was, uh, done, I think it's 2020. And also in the 2020 by ECCV, a little bit later, there was the same uh, very similar idea by Mikhail Dutmanu and Mark Polipi that if we have this 
well, they use a, bit, a little bit different. We have point correspondence, but we want to make it more precise. Precise. So we split the page into the sub patches, and we try to register centers of them. So okay, uh, they may be shifting, and because now you have two nine points, you can many do many things. First, you can use this information to make your original uh, key point correspondence more precise. Second, you can estimate scale orientation. Uh, a fine transformation out of it uh, and so on. And it's actually improving a lot uh, the like geometrical precision of the very robust but very imprecise local feature detectors like D2Net. And it also improves consequent feed reconstruction because uh, now that you would have much easier job for bundle adjustment to put in all these like projections in the single 3D point. Uh, so with this, I, I would like to conclude with like a little bit of advertising. Uh, so I'm working on this kind of problems and I was working on this kind of problems uh, in university and now I continue to do this in some companies. So uh, there could be some collaboration or we can just chat. Uh, I tweet about this like local feature papers uh, in Twitter. If you would like to monitor them, just uh, follow me on Twitter and so on. So that's it. Thank you.